page 843 in your pew Bible. And if you find that, if you could raise while we uh, read God's word. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And let's pray. Father God, as we come before you on this day that we remember your resurrection, Jesus, as James comes, as Pastor comes to expound on your word, Father, we pray that ears would be open and eyes would see, that hearts would be touched who do not know you, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would give um, James just uh, um, wisdom as he expounds your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, praise the Lord. There is no day in the life of the Christian, like Resurrection Sunday. (laughs) This is a good day. Uh, It's a good week. And it's just an incredible privilege to preach in general, but to be able to preach on Resurrection Sunday, I I just, I so uh, just desire these mornings. (laughs) Um, And again, good to have Kevin and Lori and some of the family with us this morning. And listen, we love hearing babies cry, so don't worry about that. We had an Easter a couple years ago where we had, I think, four or five babies chiming in, and it was a beautiful chorus. (laughs) Um, But praise the Lord. So here we are this morning, and we folks here, we have the benefit of being born some 2,000 plus years after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But his own disciples had no reason to believe that at that time, as far as they were concerned, their hope had perished. Their, their, their Lord, their Savior, their Master, it, he died. The week that started so wonderfully on Palm Sunday ended so savagely on Good Friday. For them, it wasn't a Good Friday. It was a, a terrible day. Their beloved Lord, Master, and King had, be, had been mercilessly beaten, crowned with thorns, and mocked. They nailed him to a cross and only a small band of disciples remained, his mother, his, mo- his mother's sister, and John, who loved the Lord. And there they were that day, and Christ had died. And again, their hope, as it were, had died. But now Sunday morning came, and there was news from the tomb that the tomb was empty. There was news that Mary had seen an angel, a vision of an angel, that said, he is risen. Peter and, and, and John had run to the tomb and they saw that it was empty. But I can tell you, even then, they were distraught. Mary and Cleopas, Cleopas was most likely the man's wife that was there at the foot of the cross. And on the road to Emmaus, they were headed back. Most likely it was Cleopas and his wife Mary. And they were sad. They were incredibly sad, despite these wonderful reports. And I know as they were walking there on the road, and they were sad between the two of them, probably thinking that maybe Mary Magdalene was delirious, thinking she saw anything. But it's that very moment that the Savior that they saw die, their Lord and their Master, just that Friday, just a few days earlier, savagely beaten, and beyond recognition, hung on that cross until dead, for them to conceive of the fact that he could have been risen from the dead was unfathomable. And even then, with those reports, as they walked, they were very sad. And it's, uh, Luke records that at that moment, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. 
but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have one with another and you're sad? And they thought he must have fallen off of another planet. Everybody in Jerusalem, all in the area, they knew what happened that last week. They knew what happened Friday. And so here Jesus is just asking them politely, what is it that makes you so sad? So again, it's Cleopas that speaks up and, and says to him, buddy, you must be from another planet. But very quickly, he brings Jesus up to speed on what things, these what things. And he says, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. You see, their hope was that this would be the king who would come to deliver them, that this would be the Messiah, the son of David. But they couldn't conceive in their hearts or in their minds that in dying, he delivered hope. In crucifixion, he brought victory. But you see, that victory is not secure until Christ rises again from the dead. And that morning, he rose and he brought that type of victory. He is the one who would redeem Israel. So there they are as they're walking with him. He goes on to say, uh, he goes on to say that this again, this is Cleopas again, saying that it was the third day. And again, certain women had gone and seen a vision and, and all that I said and Peter and John. But for them, they, they, they couldn't see it. That Their eyes were, were blinded to see that they were actually walking with the, the risen Lord and Savior. You see, when they contemplated death, death was final. When they saw Christ die on that cross and buried in that tomb, they had no expectation that someone could live again, that someone could come back from that place. Because you see, no one does, because it's sin that keeps man in the grave. It's sin and the rebellion that man has against God that has set us on a course that we are dead and we are dying and ultimately we be eternally dead. They had no conception of it. They understood just that it was because of sin that men die. The idea that, that someone would ever come back, ever since Adam, this was completely a misnomer. But now, today, was the day that all of this was going to change. Today was the day they were actually walking with Christ, unrecognizing that, but Christ was going to give them, as James Montgomery Boyce says, his sermon on the resurrection <laughs> from the Old Testament scriptures. And it's there that Jesus walked them through all of the scriptures and, and explained to them how the scriptures pointed to him. And he said to them, uh, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things? Haven't you read Isaiah, Isaiah 53? Don't you have a clue that this needed to be a suffering servant who would pay the penalty for sin? iPads are nice, except when you move your spot, when you're holding the finger down there. <laughs> Ought not he to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Into his glory? Haven't you ever read Psalm 110, 1 and 2? Verses 1 and 2, my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then again, beginning with Moses, he laid it all out for them. Jesus went again then after explaining all of this wonderful resurrection sermon to have a meal with them. The day was late. You see, they had walked seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they walked it with the Lord. And I'm sure they were starting to be buoyed a bit with this news from the scriptures and this new angle, but it's only when they had dinner together and Jesus broke the bread that they were able to see who he was. Their eyes were opened. It says their hearts burned within them, they said, as they heard him speak, but then he disappeared from their vision in a flash. But you know, at this moment, they began to get a sense of what resurrection day was about. They started to get a feeling that, you know what? This might not be the worst week ever. 
this might be the best week ever. Now they take that trek all the way back to Jerusalem, I suspect skipping along the way, maybe rehearsing some of the scriptures that Jesus was opening up to them and just, just being amazed. And of course they went and they met the, seven, the, the other 11 remaining apostles and this, this handful of disciples and they exclaimed to them, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And that has been our mantra through all these thousand, couple thousand years, that he is risen. He's risen indeed. And I believe that one of the key texts that Jesus, I'm sure, explained to them was what Blair read this morning, Psalm 16, 8 to 11. We know that it's a primary text that speaks directly about Christ because both Peter on Pentecost and Paul in the Acts of the Apostles at Antioch Pisidia explained that that was about Christ, that, that, that David was actually a prophet speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's at the heart of this psalm is the turning back of the primary curse of the fall. The primary curse of the fall is death. Death is, it, 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 and it's just a torturous, fearful thing for all of us as human beings. Still to this day, people don't even like to talk about death. Uh, even at funerals, they somehow keep it out of the talk. It, death is fearful. Death is scary. The fact that we would one day die and that our bodies would rot in a tomb is scary. But again, this is just indicative of the curse because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Surely we all will die. But this text here points towards the hope that would come the hope that all mankind could be delivered from this type of horror. And right in the midst of it is the fact that Christ's body did not see corruption. So I wanna to consider today as we look at this, I'd like you to have your Bibles open and I'd like to preach out of Psalm 16 and I'm gonna primarily be looking at verses eight through 11. I wanna see here that again, this Psalm was written by David it was written by David when he was on the run from King Saul. One of the most powerful men in the world at the time was Saul, and he wanted David dead. And if you look there at the beginning, and what's going to be really interesting about this psalm is that, of course, David did not know he was writing about the Lord Jesus Christ. At least I don't think so. I, I believe he was a prophet, of course, but I don't think he understood. That psalm is really speaking about David. It's speaking about David and his incredible faith in the face of trouble. You see there in verse one, see it's David had this incredible love and relationship with the living God. He said, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. He had an understanding that what made him and what was the purpose that he could endure any type of danger was his faith in the Lord God. That the Lord God was mighty and powerful and able to preserve King David despite all of this trouble. He recognized that there was nothing good in him that was any good apart from his relationship with the living God. He says in verse five, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. His destiny, his, his sustenance, all that he is and all that he has is in the Lord. And he saw that it's only in God that his lot was cast. But he says there in verse six, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. And it's right here, and of course, seven talks about him taking counsel from the Lord. And it's really a psalm about David's reliance on God in the midst of incredible trouble. And I think today, as we look at this text here, and we think about the enemy that is death, and the fear that it brings on us, I want to recognize that there's deliverance from it, of course. But I want to recognize it comes through faith. 
It comes through reliance. And David was a man of incredible faith, but he looked forward at best to the resurrection. I don't know if he could have ever conceived of what he was even saying, but he had a hope that someday he would be resurrected. He had a faith that one day God would deliver him some way, somehow. All good Israelites, they had a cons uh, uh, an idea about the resurrection. This was common among them. But to understand what we have compared to what he had, there's no comparison. We look back to that day with great wonder, amazement, and great faith is, that is founded on that. But David, again, being a man who was incredibly faithful, uh, despite all of his shortcomings, because it's never been that we're made right with God because we're something special. It's always been we're made right with God because God is special, because he's long-suffering and he's merciful. And David experienced the long-suffering mercy of the living God. But here I want to look at this text here. And again, verses 8 through 11, everybody agrees this is talking first and foremost about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we could bring up that first slide, I want to look, have three points here. Raised to reign, raised incorruptible, and resurrection life. First and foremost, you see there that David says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. If there's anything indicative about man is we are moved. We are shaken. Ever since the fall, our world was turned upside down. Ever since the fall, we are a bunch of chicken livers. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Uh, fearful, moved, afraid. Life tears us apart and we struggle. But David was different. He said, I'm not moved because it's the Lord who's on my side. It's the Lord who's on my right hand. David was under incredible duress from the most powerful man, as I said, but he was unmoved. He was reliant upon the Lord. Or maybe I should say in the midst of trouble, he found solace in his faith in, might, in the mighty God, in Yahweh. His faith, again, was unshakable, although at times he was incredibly shaken. But again, what is amazing to me is that David could have this type of, of confidence in the face of just a faith that had a hope of resurrection, had a hope that he might one day see God without having what we have. We now today have the founder of our faith always before the Father. David considered the Lord to be on his side, but now our faith is established in heaven. The Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, has risen from the dead, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. He's risen, and he's risen in such a way that now today we don't need to be afraid of death. We don't need to be afraid in a world that is shaken and upside down still because he has turned it right side up. In the midst of all the challenges and struggles, we have a God who is in authority. We have a God who is, again, ascended at the right to the right hand of the Father, and all authority is put under his feet, even at this moment. And that, for the Christian, is where we can find solace. That, for the Christian, is why we don't have to be afraid. No matter what our state, no matter what our condition, we can trust in God who is sure and steadfast and in control. You don't need to be afraid. But the question here is today, are we shaken? Are, are we moved at times? Are we fearful? I'd say we are often. Uh, we live in a world that's just gone crazy these days. It lends yourself to think that maybe God is not in control. Maybe the enemies got the reins of history. I can tell you it's not true. 
Because we don't live by sight, we live by faith. We live by faith in a risen Lord Jesus Christ. We have a God who knows how to get out of the tomb. He is at the right hand of the Father, and all power has been given to him. You do not need to be afraid. Your Lord and Savior died for our sins. But if possible, even more wonderfully, he has risen to the right hand of the Father, that we might be justified, and that we might have great hope and confidence that his purposes are coming about. Not the purposes of the enemy. As we think about this, and I thought about, should I even bring it up? But, but it's such an indication of this very text. This very text here, and it refers, John read there from uh, Peter's sermon on Pentecost. And the Lord's favorite text, uh, Jeff Durbin says, is, is Psalm 110, 1 and 2. My Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He is now and even now ruling and reigning over his enemies. But we live in a time when kings and rulers and despots are coming against the living God. They think they're God. They think there is no Jesus on the throne. They think they can make rules and, 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 and do it in such a way that they come against God in his right ways. Uh, you know, here recently, President Biden has decided that March 31st, which is Easter Sunday, he made this declaration on Good Friday that today would be Transgender Day of Visibility. Our governor, Kathy Hochul, followed suit, and she also is going completely aligned in declaring this day as Transgender Day. All the landmarks in New York will be lit up, Niagara Falls, One World Trade Center, Empire State Plaza, and others. Don't, don't miss this. It's because these little rulers don't want to have him to rule over them. They hate God. This is all about Christianity and the risen Lord Jesus Christ. You don't see this of other things of other religions. They're not under this type of scrutiny. Because these days we live in a, a time where the rulers are coming against the Lord, against his anointed. And let me just say here, folks, this isn't about hatred for people who are confused about their identity as human beings. It's not loving to affirm them in something that is detrimental to them. It's not right to affirm them when they were created male and created female, and that's what's best for them. For them to affirm this and to come against the living God, there's people who are so confused and upset and even hurting themselves physically. Should we shut up? Or should we declare that Jesus is Lord today? He is Lord. He is Christ. And he will put his enemies under his feet. We don't have to be afraid this morning. He is risen to the right hand of the Father. All authority in heaven and on earth are his, and he is in control. But what we need to do is not be moved, not be shaken, not be afraid, but stand up for the truth and know this truth in our heart. And if we have a chance, share that gospel humbly with folks that are confused, but pray that God might bring justice and put down these evil rulers. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will decree the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten thee. And that today I have begotten thee is speaking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and ascension to the right hand of the Father. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And these very things, Peter and Paul, they bring it out because this is common. The rulers of this world hate one thing, Jesus, if they don't know him. 
the, the creed I told you last week, Jesus is Lord, they don't like that because they rather be Lord. We heard on Good Friday that the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar because they had relinquished their love for the one true God. We ought not to do that. As I said, all authority has been given to him in heaven and earth, therefore we go, we make disciples, we baptize people, and we teach them to obey everything he's taught us. And he promises he's with us always. So first and foremost, he is raised to reign. So take heart, Christian. Today is not a day to be discouraged. Today is a day to be confident. Today is a day not to be shaken, but to know again our God reigns. Secondly, raised incorruptible. Again, like I said here, David is a man of incredible faith. He had faith that someday he would be resurrected, that somehow he would come back from Sheol. It says there, Sheol, uh, I think in Greek it's Hades. This is the place of the dead. This is a place that came into being because of sin. Because all men have sinned and our bodies are decaying and we die and we go to the place of the dead. For the Jews, they had Abraham's bosom, those that died in faith. Those that didn't, they would go to the darker place in the place of the dead. But he had this hope, you see there. It says that that my flesh will rest in hope. I think of, of Job that said, in my flesh, I shall see my redeemer. This is what they were thinking about. This was their testimony about faith, that somehow God would deliver them from this place of the dead. You see, I don't know if they had heard it, but I know Jesus quoted in the New Testament that your God is the God of the living, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. They probably didn't fully understand that, but they believed that there would be a resurrection. I think about Martha after after Lazarus had died and, and Jesus came to them and she had this perspective. And Martha said to him after he asked, Do you know that that Lazarus will rise again? She said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Again, David believed this, but there was something different about this. This wasn't just some hope of resurrection in the future. This was a guarantee that there would be one who would rise again from the dead, who would not see corruption, who would bring in a guaranteed uh, eternal life. Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And of course, she said she did. Because she had a hope of some sort of future resurrection. But she couldn't have imagined what Jesus was talking about. It's that he would go to the cross and die for their sins, be put in that tomb, but that he would rise again from the dead. That he would not see corruption like every other sinner in the world because he wasn't a sinner. He's the only man that could go to the grave and expect that he might be raised again from the dead. Jesus was that first fruits, it says in 1 Corinthians, of all them that die. This text here, what is amazing about it, it's speaking first and foremost and specifically about the Lord Jesus Christ, that his body would not rot, that he would rise again from the dead. Again, they didn't have a conception of what this is, but us, we look back and we go, oh yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. No, no, this is our victory. (laughs) This is our hope. If someone like Jesus can come back from the dead, he made a way so that we might one day rise again. So that we one day would have our new resurrected bodies. Listen, we're going to die unless he comes back before that. But in general, we're all going to die. Our bodies are getting older. Our bodies are getting weaker. We're sicker than we were yesterday. But as Christians, we have a hope that is unshakable facing that because the Lord Jesus Christ faced it and came back from the dead. He rose again on that Sunday morning, incorruptible with a guarantee that he was just the first fruits 
of all of those that put faith in him. You know that if you got harvest and you get the first fruits, there's a lot more fruit to come, right? At least in a good year. <laughs> this is a very good year. It's made all the years very good. I remember back when we talked about in, in Romans chapter 8, 19, and it talks about how all creation is groaning under the weight of sin and the curse that, that, that is there. But it talks about this curse being turned around, and ultimately it'll be fully turned around when the sons of God are raised from the dead. When on that day, he fully consummates his plan and raises his people. It said, Paul said this, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. How? In hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Our flesh can rest in hope. If we have family that have died in faith, we can have confidence and hope they will be resurrected. That we don't have to worry if tomorrow we go out and get hit by a car and die, that we're just going to fall asleep. And that one day we will rise again from the dead. That one day we will have resurrected bodies. Why? Because Jesus rose. What will our bodies be like? Read about Jesus' body. That's our hope. Our flesh can rest in hope because his flesh never saw corruption. But up from the grave he arose. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. That's booing <laughs> in the midst of any type of struggle or trial. He is now reigning because he arose on that day. He has risen victorious over hell, death, and the grave over every one of our enemies. And the worst and most wicked enemy will finally one day, which is death, be destroyed. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, Afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming, and then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to, the, to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, he now is ruling and reigning. He now is putting every one of his enemies under his feet, whether they are in this world or they are in the dark domain of principalities and powers. He is ruling and reigning over every foe till now. The guarantee of it is that if you die and rise again from the dead, you rule. <laughs> You're Lord. You are king. And there are no one that can stand against you. For he has put all things under his feet. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Here's that shale, oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to fear death today. Jesus never saw corruption. There are liberal thinkers out there that want to tell you the Bible is a ruse and that Jesus died like any other man, that he was put in a grave never to rise again. The Jews tried to put him in that grave, put a seal about it and guards in front of it. There's nothing that could prevent Christ from rising to reign and to rule and to change the life of those who put faith in him that we as Christians who trust in him have this great hope. David had faith in God, a wonderful faith. He doesn't have what we have. We have a risen Lord Jesus Christ. 
we have a sure and steadfast hope established in the heavenlies. He is at the right hand of the Father, even now. And even in places in Ephesians, it says we are seated with him in heavenly places. I don't think we understand all that we have and what is the implications of the resurrection as Christians. For you will not leave my soul in shale. Final point, resurrection life. Verse 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There is so much packed into this one verse, so many different ways that we can go. But first and foremost, this path that leads to life is the path that Christ has established, that now the gates of the grave are open, that now the penalty and power from sin, for sin that brings death has been broken over the believer, that now we can have life, life eternal with him. That when I think about the idea of sin, and we have to go back to the garden to think about sin, they were in the presence of God. Adam and Eve were in the presence of the living God. They had a relationship with him, an unmitigated relationship where they could walk with the Lord in the cool of the day. They could fellowship with him. The day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. And they began to die physically. But I think the worst penalty was separation from God. Tossed out of the garden, unable to have a relationship and presence with their creator, the lover of their souls. You see there, David, he understood what was the point, what is the essence of true joy, what is the essence of true pleasure. It's all encompassed within God. So often we are chasing our tails for pleasure, joy, and fun. We're chasing idols daily, but Christ died and rose again so that we don't need to do that. We can repent, turn away from all of those things that are falsely bringing us any type of joy and pleasure and find our enjoyment alone in God. <coughs> But we have something better than David. We're able to look back to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're able to see that, that Jesus has risen from the dead. We're able to see now that not just is he the way to life through faith, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can be justified because of our faith in this risen savior, but now there's a way of life. You see, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them this whole wide world to live in, to live in it rightly, to have children, to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with the glory of God, but then they fell. But now through Christ, we have been raised with him. We now are able to, to follow life in a different manner. I think about, we think about resurrection. What is resurrection life? Oh, it's Easter Sunday. That's when everybody goes to church, Easter Sunday. The rest of the year, maybe not. Or, or, or then maybe some folks just come on Sunday, right? Uh, let me just put my time in. Christ's resurrection has changed the believer in such a way that now we can pursue life rightly. We can live as God originally designed us. We're not gonna be perfect, but we're able to live differently because of our connection with Christ. Through faith, we are united to Christ, Paul talked about in Romans. So united and knit to Christ that we have died with him, we were buried with him, and we have ri ri risen again with him. But we've risen to what? So that one day we might be raised from the dead? Yes, hallelujah! but that so we might live lives that are reflective of this resurrection life. 
Paul made it so clear for us what this narrow way looks like, what it looks like to, to live lives uh, that, are, that, are, that are marked by salvation. This resurrection life consists of living life with our Lord leading us into a completely different path and way of being. So Paul said this in Romans 6, verses 4 and following. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There's a way to live in this world that is completely different from what we used to be because we've been raised with Christ, because our old man has been buried with Christ. Christ died for our sins so that we might have the power of sin broken over our lives. You don't have to live under the, the weight of sin any longer. I'm not calling for a perfectionism here. I'm saying, Christian, we ought to look different. We ought to walk in such a way that we walk, Paul says, in newness of life. This newness of life is what resurrection life is all about. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And this is where Paul makes the connection. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's resurrection life. It means that we can, can glorify God in such a way with our lives. But it's not because you can, you can work it up or do it yourself. It's because Christ rose from the dead. It's because we're so united to him that as, as he died for our sins, we ought to reckon ourselves. We need to say, you know what? I'm not going to live like that. I don't have to. You don't, Christian. Sin's power has been broken over us because Christ rose again from the dead. Even those sins that seem most hardest to get over and to get past, that's why when we preach the gospel, we preach a gospel that's able to change people. That's why we don't sit back and try to affirm people in their sin. We tell them there is another way. Yes. Christ died for your sins. He paid the penalty. He rose again from your justification. Now you can live the way he intended you to be. He made you a male. He made you a female. Get married. Don't try to... It's crazy. It's crazy. But that's just one instance of how our society is so upside down. Because they don't know that there's a Savior. They don't know that he's risen from the dead. And if they do, they don't recognize that he's changed us. So that now we might live according to his ways. So that now we can raise families that are glorifying to him. You always see it when it goes through Paul in Ephesians. He lays out all of what we have in Christ. He always ends with application. It's about individuals loving one another, turning from their sins. It's about husbands and wives loving one another, raising families. It's about fathers and mothers teaching their children and admonishing them to, to, to live according to God's ways. It's here now. Resurrection life is here now. We have a message of transformation. But if we don't live it, it's hard to preach it. Okay? That is the resurrection life that we lead now with the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That same power that raised him from the dead is resident within the believer today. It's at our disposal by faith. We now are able to have an unmitigated relationship and presence of God with us. We're now filled with the Holy Spirit. We're the temple of God. It has begun. We've been restored to that relationship. And it's wonderful. 
But you know what, too? <laughs> One day he'll come again. <laughs> One day sin, hell, death, and the grave will give themselves up. Someday every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And we will be raised incorruptible. And we will have bodies like the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, that is not a pipe dream. That is not just a fancy passing thought. That's an assurity. It's been assured and it's been confirmed because Christ is risen. He is now at the right hand of the Father. He's not some disembodied spirit. He's the God-man. He added to himself humanity for all of eternity, the second person of the Trinity, to be our forerunner, to deliver us. One day he will come again and consummate his kingdom. There will be no more sin, death, shield in the grave. Jesus again has assured that to us as we celebrate it here today. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now all things are made subject to him. Then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's our confidence this morning, this Resurrection Sunday. Let's come forward, the musicians, if you would. We want to sing a, in so, a song of response here, Glorious Day. So please be rise and he said we're gonna sing oh glorious day. What a day, what a day.
Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you now. Almighty God, God of all love, thank you, Father, for your loving kindness. Your grace and your mercy are everlasting. There is power in your love to heal the brokenhearted and to comfort the soul. Help us, Father, to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. Fill our hearts with love for him. Help us to remember the sacrifice that has been made for us. There is no greater love than this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, that sin can be forgiven and the gift of eternal life. Living, he loved us. Dying, he saved us. Buried, he carried our sins far away. Rising, he justified us. And one day, he will come for us. Praise him, O oh glorious day. Now, grant, we beseech thee, mighty God, that the words which we have heard here this day with our outer ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that we may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to honor and praise the name through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be dismissed. Amen.